good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everybody uh, we have the pleasure of having with us our vice chairman that is the vice chairman of prime minister's museum and library executive council dr a surya prakash and uh, we have our respected director with us today shri sanjeev nandan sahai and we have the rare uh, honor and privilege of having uh, honorable chairman executive council shri nivendra mishra ji also who has very kindly agreed to preside for this lecture so i welcome them all and i welcome all members of the audience i can see that the hall is full and we are delighted about it before we start the program may i request everybody to put their mobile phones on silent mode uh may i now request honorable chairman to deliver welcome address thank you dr surya prakash ji he is vice chairman of our executive council here <clears throat> he is also a very good friend and on many occasions he is my guide too <laughs> so when i got to know that he is going to speak on the subject of democracy i was as much interested as you all are <coughs> this subject has been his passion he has been writing reading and in spite of historical setbacks to democracy in different countries he strongly believes and very rightly that democracy is not to be seen in a narrow sense of institutional operations but has to be seen in the broader context of what one would like to for want a better word maybe he will describe and explain it better the democratic temper <coughs> are the socio cultural historical base for this magic word called democracy <clears throat> though all of you know dr surya prakash but it is customary to introduce and to say few words about his achievements he is of course an author and columnist he is today recognized as a leading commentator on indian constitutional and parliamentary issues and governance in last 53 years roughly more than 50 years for sure mr prakash or dr surya prakash ji was very much part of the politics and governance <coughs> to that extent he is an insider he of course held key positions in the world of journalism that's how he started his career he has been editor of g news 
enjoyed higher position in Pioneer, then in Asia Times. Political editor to Inadu Group of Newspapers, Chief of Bureau of Indian Express, New Delhi. We all know that as the chairman, chairperson of Prasar Bharti, He tried and succeeded in bringing about a change in the work culture of the Prasar Bharti. He is in the advisory council of Vivekanand International Foundation, director of India Foundation. Very often, government relies on his impartial, very transparent style of working by putting him in various committees. The last such assignment which was given to him was to be a member of the search committee for the Lokpal, which, as you know, is the India's ombudsman at the national level. He has written books which are widely acclaimed. Few which immediate mention comes to my notice is what ails Indian Parliament. It is a very comprehensive book on the working of the parliamentary system. He also wrote on public money, private agenda, the use and misuse of MP LAD scheme, he did not spare the emergency. And his book was India's Democracy's Darkest Hour. which was released in 2017 by the Honorable Vice President of India. <coughs> it is a very forthright commentary on what happened during emergency. This book was released, and he wrote, and of course, we all welcome that, but that was on one condition, that he will also write about India's finest hours. And I think the time has come when that should become the volume two of his work on the working of India. Not many of you may know that as vice chairperson of this institution, he very ably contributed to Pradhan Mantri Sangrahale. He was heading the content committee, which was responsible for writing the script of each gallery. He was involved in the selection of technology to ensure that the galleries are as close to the truth and reality as would be possible.
And finally, the technology and the script and the message from the Singrahale, these three areas, he was really the chief coordinator. And I have to admit that I depended largely on his contribution. Dr. Stuart Prakash has chosen a very difficult subject. We, of course, were taught by the people, for the people, of the people. But that was for our general knowledge. But when we go deep into it, then it gets very complicated. What is democracy? To my mind, it is one of the most difficult definitions. Is it institutional? Is it the working? What is real democracy? What is the democratic temper? And all these questions get very complicated when we deal with a country such as India. It's a diverse country. It has various traditions, social traditions. A very complex history through which the country has passed, their impact, and then when we analyze democracy, or the essence of democracy, or the practice of democracy in this country, it does appear to me that in spite of certain hiccups here and there. One such hiccup was yesterday, the Supreme Court judgment. Overall, the democracy, both in terms of practice, in terms of essence, in terms of delivery, in terms of proving that it is for the people and it is of the people, I think we can be proud of whatever we have achieved or we have protected. I just referred to hiccup. I think before it is misunderstood, I have to say one or two words. I was associated with it. When this particular electoral bond was thought of, there was a great deal of enthusiasm and commitment. There is even now, but that was just beginning and therefore, you know, a beginner is always more enthusiastic. A novice is always more enthusiastic. Iska Hindi Urdu mein kuch hai, lekin wo nahi kar raho mein. We thought we would be able to tackle this curse of black money. Demonetization was done in spite of all the criticism it did achieve. <coughs> At least the black money was on the center stage. When this was introduced, 
I am saying this because see how a mistake can occur if you are not able to take a very balanced view of policies. This is a very burning, very good example. We are thinking of black money. I am including political system also, those who were advisors to the Prime Minister and also the bureaucratic system. And we thought that so much of cash goes to the political parties and it's huge money. It's not 2,000 rupees. It's not just ceiling of 20,000 rupees. So if somehow we created a bond and the political, uh, the corporates were encouraged to buy the bonds, then we will achieve one stage that the economy, electoral economy would move from cash to the check, to the bonds. During discussion, it was pointed out, including by corporates, which today, I mean, I, I agree, the logic has got reversed, and very rightly, that if you don't keep it secret, then the practice of giving in cash will continue. So, because of that misplaced emphasis on black money in the cash form, and that must get curbed, we were sold by this idea that let's have the bond, let's keep it secret, so that the corporates can contribute and buy. And that's where we went. Perfectly democratic, perfectly with good intentions. But what was missed was, we did not appreciate that this bond is a white money. And there can be attempts. A, there is a skewed advantage to the ruling party. B, that there will be attempts to convert this white money into black money through other methods. In yesterday's many debates on some of the channels, this point came out very well. So this point was missed, totally missed. We were wrong in assuming that the black money curse will go away. In some manner, another channel started of getting the white money and then converting into black. And that is why now it is being argued that the only way is, that may not be 100% successful, the way is that the Election Commission should provide funding for election expenditure. I gave this example and I mention hiccup only because it is temporary phase. Good things will again come, and judiciary has very rightly warned us that you were wrong in assuming that everything can be done by this measure. So such is the complexity in which Indian democracy is operating. And therefore, I very strongly commend, admire Dr. Surya Prakash that in spite of the challenges, he still keeps <coughs> his commitment to democracy and continues 
to do his research work on this subject of democracy. With these words, I welcome, I have been a bit too lengthy in my introduction. I must be excused for that. But with these words, I now request Dr. Surya Prakash to enlighten us. Thank you. <clears throat> Sir, uh, respected uh, ch chairman, sir, um, the director, Mr. Sahai, and uh, other colleagues from this institution and friends who are assembled here today. Um, I thank all of you for being here for this lecture. And sir, um, it's uh, really very kind of you. I thank you for your kind words and uh, um, very generous uh, observations about uh, my role in this institution <laughs> and um, in other institutions. But I must say that it's been an honor and a privilege uh, to be working with you in PMML and of course when you were Principal Secretary to Prime Minister and I was Chairman Prasar Bharti, I used to always uh, seek your advice and guidance in handling my own responsibilities and it has been a wonderful journey and a great learning experience for me so i i really thank you for uh, being there uh, to guide us all and uh, especially for me so i shall now uh, begin my lecture on democracy in ancient and modern india I will say that um, I have been interested in democracy studies for the last uh, 35 to 40 years and uh, it has resulted in certain publications uh, by me in regard to the working of uh, democratic institutions in the country and the way uh, it has all shaped out. And also <clears throat> I've had interest in uh, the democratic uh, traditions of India in the past and I am of the view and I will come to that later that um, straight away let me put that up front. I will say that India is a secular liberal democratic nation because we are civilizationally secular and democratic. That is why we are what we are, that is why we have the constitution we have. So I will deal with that later after this presentation or at the end of it. Uh, so, the first point is, so let us straight away go back to the Vedic age. Both the Rig Veda, Atharva Veda refer to the Sabha and Samiti as assemblies which deliberated on issues of state. It advised the king and ministers. Scholars say that the word Janapada is used 40 times in the Rig Veda, 9 times in the Atharva Veda and several times in the Brahmana texts. Uh, the Samiti was an august assembly of a larger group of people for the discharge of political business presided over by the Rajan. <coughs> the Sabha was a more selective body. Both <coughs> these assemblies exercised considerable authority and acted as healthy checks on the power of the kings. Great importance was attached not only to the concord between the king and the assembly but also to a spirit of harmony among members of the assembly. The Sabha and Samiti are described as the two daughters of Prajapati. The Rajan seeks the blessings of both of them. The Yajurveda outlines the coronation oath of the Rajan and a kind of benediction which says, as a ruler from this day onwards, judge the strong and the weak impartially and fairly, strive unceasingly to do good to the people and above all, project the protect the country from all calamities. For uh, Vedas, <clears throat> So these are all, um, you know, observations of scholars who have uh, studied, uh, done deep studies in Sanskrit literature and uh, they have come to some of these conclusions. The four Vedas provide us the information about political and representative institutions in ancient India. There is 
enough evidence in the Vedas about people's participation in decision making and their reliance on collective wisdom. There is considerable information in our ancient texts on Janapadas, village councils and Ganasangas. Um, so the point is that we go back at least 2500 years, somewhere from 2500 to 3000 years ago, you had the <clears throat> core ideas of democracy flourishing in many of these uh, societies at that time in India. Panini's grammar of Sanskrit, Ashtadhyayi, uses the term Janapada 13 times and refers by name to 18 Janapadas. Lichavis and Shakyas are ancient examples of self-governing communities. Different forms of governance coexisted. These terms you hear today, you know, in regular debates on democracy, Lok Tantra, Janatantra, Prajatantra, Ganatantra, that is Republic, and Rajatantra, communities that had elected representatives and elected kingships. The kings were bound by the common law of dharma. In later centuries, even when he was the sovereign ruler of the state, the king did not enjoy any exemption from the code of conduct of dharma. In fact, the Dharma Shastra puts the strictest restrictions on the arbitrary use of power by the state. The Dharma Shastras outline a detailed list of royal duties. It's called Raja Dharma. Thus, the king was not an uncommon and extraordinary individual who was above the rules of Dharma, which in effect constituted the law in ancient India. He was expected to be the most sincere, polite, and benevolent servant of his subjects. <clears throat> so the theory and practice of government was largely republican, uh, largely republican in nature, entailing the expression of the alternative idea of government through an assembly representing the larger section of people, say scholars. So the ancient Indian kingship may be clearly understood through the sublime and conspicuous democratic, responsive, accountable and law-abiding character of the kings. So, in Kalidasa's Abhigyan Shakuntalam, there is a reference to democratic traditions. The right to democracy is absolute and without any discrimination. This is testimony to the democratic values in administration in ancient India. <clears throat> so, um, here is a quote from Kalidasa's Raghuvancham about the qualities of the king. As he was free from avarice, his subjects became prosperous. As he dispelled their fears of ob obstacles, they performed their religious rites and he corrected them. They had in him a father and uh, as he smoothed away their grief, they had in him a son as well. Political science literature in India is full of democratic traditions in Greece and Athens. How I wish we had introduced to, we were introduced to these truths, which I am talking about now, about republics in India when we were in school and college. And we were taught about the evidence of democratic traditions in the Vedas and the Mahabharata. This is something that has been absolutely missing as I see in the first 75 years after independence, it wasn't there during the British period, uh, colonial period, and one can well understand that. But what happened after 1947, August 15th, is something which is truly tragic in terms of our understanding of our own culture and civilization. Um, so, we come to Kautilya's Arthashastra. Uh, so, it it presents a highly exalted idea of kingship. In the happiness of his population rests the ruler's happiness. In their welfare lies his welfare. He shall not necessarily consider as good whatever pleases him, but he shall consider as good <coughs> whatever pleases his population. Look at this. You please uh, spend a minute on this particular slide. The Arthashastra gives us insights into the strong welfare state that existed during the Mauryan Empire. He says, seeds, provisions, loans, 
must be provided to peasants at the time of famine. State must help in agricultural operations. Provide exemption from agriculture tax to peasants who rejuvenate <coughs> tanks and water bodies. Money lenders will be told to give exemptions on rate of interest to borrowers who are students and those in socio-economic distress. <coughs> the state has to pay special attention to destitute children, women in need of help, widows and protection of minors, senior citizens and the poor must be central to state policy. Their concern must be central to state policy. So, this brings us to the question of, you know, this differential rate of interest. I remember I had then joined the Indian Express in Bangalore and I travelled, sir, extensively with uh, Chief Minister Devrajars in the 70s. And every month he would go to the far-flung far districts of the state and look at welfare schemes and so on. And Indira Gandhi had uh, uh, issued a 20-point program, uh, many of them related to social welfare. In India, if there was one chief minister who took that program seriously, it was Devrajars. And I had the opportunity of travelling with him extensively. And I found that he would insist on a differential rate of interest for farmers, especially in the drought-affected areas and so on and so forth. So, we are. I am now talking of Arthashastra and what, what is being said there, you know, millennia ago, in regard to differential rate of interest, concern for um, farmers, especially in conditions of famine and so on. And uh, in later days, we saw <coughs> this operating in terms of uh, the policies of the governments in India. And of course, I will come to the directive principles of state policy. Tax concessions to students in gurukulas, hermits and individuals who are visually orally challenged. This is Arthashastra. <coughs> state must protect the rights of workers to fair wages, right of free movement of people, right to medical aid and such other social, economic and political rights that citizens ought to have. That is why Ambedkar said, <coughs> mere political freedom will not do. We need to have, you know, social um, equality. <coughs> mere political equality will not do. We need social equality, economic equality. All these are precepts which were there in this country millennia ago. And I can see at least five articles which are loaded in favour of the working class in our constitution. This is part of the constitution and it has a strong socialist tilt. So, the Arthashastra and Directive Principles. All of this and much more stands incorporated in part 4 of the constitution under the head Directive Principles of State Policy. Article 38. The state to secure a social order for the promotion of welfare of people, justice, social, economic and political shall inform all institutions. The state shall strive to minimize inequalities in income. Article 39. The state shall direct policy to ensure ownership and control of material resources are so distributed as best to subserve the common good. Operation of economic system does not result in concentration of wealth and means of production. Health and strength of workers, tender age of children not abused. Children have opportunity to develop in a healthy manner. Given these extracts from the Arthashastra of Kautilya, going back to 300 BC, that is 2,300 years ago, is it not absurd for us to teach students uh, in our schools and colleges that the directive principles of state policy were picked up from the Irish constitution or some other constitution or that the principles of a socialistic pattern of society came from the Soviet Union or some Western thinkers. It is possible that our constitution makers were influenced by the wording of these provisions in other constitutions. But the truth is that the marma and dharma embedded there is entirely drawn from our civilizational experience. The Irish were certainly not the originators of the directive principles of state policy. Kautilya certainly was. As stated earlier, if we look within, 
we will find these principles going back around two millennia within India. So then Article 42 says, that is our constitution today, provision of just human conditions of work and maternity benefit, uh, maternity relief. You know, maternity um, leave has gone up from 12 months to 26 months in India today. And I think India is one of the leading countries in regard to taking care of women uh, at the time of childbirth. In, in fact, uh, pregnant women and subsequently after childbirth, the initiatives that have been taken by government. And this is what the constitution expects our governments to do. Article 43, living wage and better conditions of work for, uh, work for workers and leisure. Article 43 uh, A is workers' participation in management. Then I come to Arthashastra and directive principles. Granville Austin says the purpose of directive principles was to find a middle way between individual liberty and public good. B. N. Rao, who drafted the principles, said directive principles were moral precepts for the authorities of the state. K. N. Panika says the directive principles seek to usher in economic democracy as envisaged by B. R. Ambedkar, who said mere political democracy is not enough. So, um, some legal doctrines. This is the doctrine of escheat. In Indian law, doctrine of escheat is embedded in section 29 of the Hindu Succession Act, which provides for failure of heirs. That is, when if a person dies without leaving a will and without having heirs. Uh, so, this doctrine comes into play. It says if an intestate, that's a person who had died without leaving a will, if an intestate has left no heir uh, qualified to succeed to his or her property in accordance with the provisions of this act, such property shall devolve on the government and the government shall take over property along with obligations, etc. However, the doctrine of escheat was not unknown to India. Manu referred to it in his laws, in, that is in chapter 9, which say that the king has the right to all the properties belonging to persons who die without leaving an heir. King Dushyanta and the doctrine of escheat. This is very, very important because uh, we have been told, I have uh, been told in law college uh, that many of these things have come. Uh, we have learned this from the British and uh, this has to be challenged. These kind of conclusions which have prevailed in our education and in our curricula for the last 200 years. So this is Abhigyan Shakuntala Act, uh, Act 6. King Dushyanta is informed that a merchant who was who has huge wealth and who is childless has died on the high seas. The minister tells the minister that um, king that as per existing law, the merchant's estate must go to the state. However, at this juncture, the king asks if any of the merchant's wives is pregnant. He said, let enquiry be made. There may be a, wi a wife who is with a child. He is told that one of the merchant's wives is soon to become a mother. On learning this, the king pronounces his judgment. The king awards the estate to the child in the womb. He also declares that henceforth he is ever ready to play the role of the departed kinsman to the bereaved families. So, um, the rights of the unborn are also there in our other laws. Um, this is called a child in utero. This principle stands incorporated in Transfer of Property Act and Hindu Succession Act, Section 20 of Hindu Succession Act says, a child who was in the womb at time of death of an interstate and subsequently born alive shall have the same rights as if he, were, he existed when that person uh, died. So that is there. Then therefore, under Section 20, a child in the womb who has come into existence will be entitled share of the property only if the child is in the womb is at the, is, at, uh, is in the womb at the time of death of the estate owner and the child is born alive. So, now here again, this was something you see that um, um, this was something that uh, we presumed wa was uh, 
something we picked up in our laws from uh, British laws. I was told in law college that escheat was a doctrine that was borrowed from English law, that it was a remnant of the English feudal system of land tenure, and this concept was known in common law as bona vacancia. Then, the Lichavi, Yodeha and Ambasta republics are Ganasangas. The head of state and other important functionaries were elected. The Aitreya Brahmana records the emergence of Hindu republics around 1000 BC. Membership of the Central Assembly was as high as 5000 among the Yudeyas and 7,707 among the Lichavis. Meetings were characterized by harmonious debates and the opinion of the elders was sought. So, there are elements of bicameralism even at that stage because there was some process of consultation of elders. Then we come to the assembly of the Ambasta Republic first appointed generals to oppose Alexander but later accepted the advice of their elders and decide to make peace proposals. So, this is where I am talking about uh, bicameralism or the first signs of bicameralism. Uh, so, the Lichavi Gana Raja, the assembly elected the Rajan, the Uparajan, the Senapati and the Bandagatika, that is the treasurer, the key administrative posts. There were also several other posts which were filled through process of election. These included posts which were needed to administer and run the assembly itself, like the Asana Pannapaka, who was the first to be elected. He had the responsibility to ensure proper seating arrangements of members, the elders and members rich in experience were the first to be seated. This is much like the arrangement in our parliament where former prime ministers and MPs of long standing are allotted seats in the front row. I remember Indrajit Gupta who was elected to the Lok Sabha nine times would always have a front row seat irrespective of which party had won the elections and who was ruling this country. So also is the case with Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Chandrasekhar and so on. So these are ideas which I find were there in the Lichavi Republic some 2500-3000 years ago. They, the first thing they did was to elect this Asana Pannapaka. His job was to make the seating arrangements and all the elders and men of women of experience were to find their place in the front row. Then election of parliamentary officials. Election of parliamentary officials. This, the second to be elected was the person who was to move the resolutions. The third person to be elected was the Salaka Gahapaka, whose job was to conduct elections or record voting in the assembly. He distributed the Salaka, that is the ballot made of wood, which would have a red or black mark. A member voting in favour of the motion would pick up red and a member voting against would pick up black. The collection of votes, the collection of votes was called Salaka Grahana. So, India was studied with republics 2500-3000 years ago. These were republics, meaning they elected their head of state as distinct from a monarchy. And in regard to republics, I regard republics to be far superior to monarchies and more in tune with democratic principles than monarchies. Therefore, India as a republic in my view has a much superior democratic status than the United Kingdom which has at the moment King Charles as the head of state. Because a republic ensures that a Ramnath Kovind or a Draupadi Murmu who hail from communities which have been socially, educationally, economically backward for long years can be head of state. Apart from the United Kingdom, there are many nations in Europe and Scandinavia which have hereditary heads of state who practice what I regard as Parivarvad and which is accepted by the people in those countries. In the course of my studies over the years, the democracy studies, I have examined over 80 constitutions across the world and I must tell you that a lot of these nations which are now regarded as very modern, uh, progressive and prosperous nations 
um, they have very defective uh, democratic uh, traditions, unlike India. So unlike these nations, where some individuals and families are more equal than others, the Indian Republic guarantees equality before law and the equal protection of the law, that is Article 14, no discrimination, Article 15, on the grounds of religion, language, gender, caste, creed, or place of birth, and all the fundamental rights under Article 20, uh, Article 19. So, rule of law. In the Lichavi Republic, every case was decided on merits. The status of the person or community, that is the Kula, he belonged to, did not matter. The punishment was in proportion to the crime, and the same rule applied to everyone. We have often heard the Supreme Court quote Thomas Fuller's pithy aphorism to a person who holds or has held an important public office and say, be ye ever so high, the law is above you. This is the core principle in Article 14 which guarantees equality before law and the equal protection of law. There was a highly developed and advanced legal system and constitutionalism in India around 6,000 years before Christ. So, King Dushyanta and Article 14. Abhignana Shakuntalam, a young student in the Gurukul, objects to the king killing a deer as it belongs to the ashram. The king bows to the young student's dictate. The student says, O king, this deer belongs to the ashram and must not be killed. The king says, Stop the chariot. The student, Restore your arrow to the quiver. You are given weapons, but not to strike the innocent. The king says, It is done. The hermit says, a deed worthy of you, a shining example of kings. The king says, we must not disturb the ashram. He asks the charioteer to stop the chariot at a distance. Then the king says, one should wear modest garments when entering an ashram. Take these jewels and bow, he says, and gives them to the charioteer. Important to note that this signifies the principle of rule of law and equality before law. The judicial system was multi-tiered in ancient India, much like the present day. At the lower level was the Kulaka court. The decisions of this court were subject to higher jurisdiction. Decisions of this court could be appealed against before the Gana court, that is the judicial body constituted by the assembly. The Gana court decision was subject to the appellate jurisdiction of the ruler or monarch. Also, the doctrine of res judicata was adhered to. Citizenship rules were well developed, including rules pertaining to grant of citizenship to outsiders. Res judicata. Res judicata is a principle which says a cause of action cannot be re-litigated in the same forum once it has been judged on merits. In other words, a losing plaintiff cannot re-sue a winning defendant on the same cause of action which, however, does not preclude appeals before a higher court. Reopening of closed matter was regarded as a crime. Section 11 of the Indian Civil Procedure Court says, a court shall not hear any suit or issue in which the matter directly or substantially in issue has been directly and substantially in issue in a former suit between the same parties litigating under the same title in a court competent to try such subsequent suit. I had learnt it by rote very recently to take my law exams. Doctrine of separation of powers has been well developed in ancient India. There was clear demarcation of the powers of legislature, the executive and the judicial wing of the state. The purpose was to ensure checks and balances. So, uh, Section 11 of the Civil Procedure Code, this is provided in Seventh Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, also the Fifth Amendment that protects citizens from double jeopardy. We were taught in law school that rest judicata emerged as a concept in English common law system and adopted by other nations which follow judge-made law or law based on precedents and in nations which follow civil law that is codified in a statute or in a constitution. We were never told that this prevailed in India 3,000 years ago. This is the tragedy of our education system 
which has remained a slave to Macaulay. So, uh, separation of powers. Um, Doctrine of separation of powers. Our political science and law textbooks attribute the doctrine of separation of powers to Montesquieu's noted work, The Spirit of the Laws, published in the 18th century, and that the seeds of the idea were present in the writings of the 16th century French theologian and reformer John Calvin. But there is little reference to the presence of this doctrine in ancient India. Montesquieu's theory of separation of powers influenced the American constitution makers and it is one of the core ideas in the American Constitution. Uh, so, um, the parliamentary procedure in ancient India was advanced. Uh, actually, when I came into journalism, I was told that uh, there is a, a book called May's Parliamentary Practice, and one must read that to understand parliament procedure. And then, of course, we had Kaul and Shakta, produce the Indian version of May's parliamentary practice. But uh, we were never taught that the parliamentary procedure in ancient India was quite advanced. This Salaka Gahapaka collected the ballots, counted them and announced the result of the voting to the assembly. Those who could not attend a meeting were allowed to vote by proxy, subject to rules. Cantankerous speeches were prohibited as also pointless observations. The clerks of the house recorded proceedings. The assembly had a quorum rule. This was our, there were our differing views about the strength of the assembly. It varies from 999, that is Indian scholars, to 5000, Greek chroniclers. In contrast, Greek Athenian democracy has had larger assemblies, but attendance was low. The rules provided for proxy voting, issue of whips, reference to committees, different systems of voting including voice vote and balloting. Parliamentary procedure in ancient India was advanced. Everything was decided by majority. Voting was open or secret depending on the decision of the assembly. There were three kinds of voting, secret, whispering and open. The assembly had a teller who would distribute the voting sticks. They were colored wooden sticks. Those voting in favor of the motion picked up sticks with the red mark. Those voting against the motion chose sticks with the black mark. The decision of the full assembly was final. The minutes of the meetings were recorded. This included the deliberations of the decisions taken. Before final passage, the main thrust of the resolution was repeated by the chair three times so that there could be no confusion. In fact, even now, when I cover parliament and watch the proceedings in state assemblies, I find the speaker say that three times as to, as to exactly what is being passed. So, parliamentary procedure in uh, ancient India, this is like the passage of bills in parliament, which has to be voted at the introduction stage, the consideration stage, and the final reading, where the speaker says, those in favor may say aye, those against may say no. The present speaker, of course, says all this in Hindi. Often the majority view is determined by the speaker on the basis of his auditory perception of where the majority lay. Also, parliamentary procedure was rather advanced. It provided for quorum, proxy voting, issue of whips, different systems of voting, including voice vote and balloting. Parliamentary procedure in ancient India was advanced. In the Lichavi Ganasanga Assembly, the rule was that those in favor remained silent. Those who opposed the motion stood up to speak. This was another form of voice out which enabled the presiding officer to determine the majority. Then, uh, in today's Lok Sabha, the Secretary General and other senior officials of the uh, Lok Sabha Secretariat carry out the functions of the Asana Pannapaka and Salaka Gahapaka, who decide seating arrangements, the counting of votes where a motion is put before the house and hand out slips to members 
when the electronic device malfunctions in the house. There aren't any red and black wooden valves, but members have to press either the green, red or orange button to decide their support, opposition or abstention during a vote. There are also turban marshals who are constantly by the speaker's side and whispering advice into his ears even as the proceedings are on. So, um, here the rule was that those in favor remained silent, those who opposed the motion stood up to speak. And there was another form of voice out which enabled the presiding officer to determine the majority. Parliamentary rules in Buddhist assemblies. The rules of procedure and debates in the meetings of Buddhist Sangha were modeled on those of the assemblies of the Gana or Sangha states. A Buddhist chapter required a quorum of 20. It is likely that a similar rule prevailed in meetings of political Sangha. Panini refers to Ganathitha as the person whose attendance completed the quorum in a Gana and to Sangathitha as one who completed the quorum in the Sangha. A person who acted as whip to secure the quorum is described as the Ganapar, Ganaparaka or Mahavagga in Panini 3. You can read more about that. An officer in charge of allocation of seats and then the Sangha Mukhya regulated the debate. He was to observe strict impartiality, otherwise he was furiously criticized. In the Buddhist Sangha, motion was thrice proposed and passed. Even today, if you see our assemblies and parliament, the speaker says, those in favor may say aye, those in favor may, again may say no, and he does that three times, so that there is no confusion about uh, the person who is voting and where he, would, he or she wants to vote. Then we come to parliamentary rules in Buddhist assemblies. Buddhist Sanghas adopted parliamentary rules that prevent in the Gana Sanghas. They had parliamentary rules or a requirement of quorum, whips, voting by ballot, etc. Dr. Ambedkar referred to this in his concluding remarks on the Constitution on November 25, 1949 in the Constituent Assembly. He wanted to make it clear that democratic practices were not alien to the people of Bharat. The Buddhist Sanghas adopted parliamentary rules that prevailed. Mm, yeah. Okay, Dr. Ambedkar said, it is not that India did not know what is democracy. There was a time when India was studded with republics. It is not that India did not know parliaments or parliamentary procedure. A study of Buddhist Bhikshu Sanghas discloses that not only there were parliaments, but the Sanghas knew and observed all the rules of parliamentary procedure known to modern times. <clears throat> And Dr. Ambedkar, these are his concluding remarks on this subject. He says, they had rules regarding all that which I described just now. They had rules regarding seating arrangements, rules regarding motions, resolutions, quorum, whips, voting by ballot, censure motion, res judicata, etc. The Buddha must have borrowed them from the rules of political assemblies functioning in the country at that time. He concludes, that is, Dr. Ambedkar concludes by lamenting that India lost this democratic system. I am of the view that uh, we, the Islamic invasions and then the other uh, intrusions that happened and disturbed our society and civilization for about 1200 or 1300 years completely disrupted the system and this is one great opportunity for us after independence, for us to regain this civilizational strength and this enormous uh, gift that actually India has given to the world in terms of democratic traditions. So now we come to um, the king in Europe and in India. The Europeans believed in the divinity of the king. Alexander the Great was deified. Roman emperors were deified. The monarchy was regarded as divinely ordained institutions and kings were accountable to God alone. It was believed that even bad kings were divine and responsible to God alone. Blackstone, the English jurist, went so far as to say that the king is not only incapable of doing wrong, but also of thinking wrong. 
so the king in europe and in india this was not the case in india only good and pious kings were regarded as divine by ancient hindus bad and impious ones were dubbed as demoniac in the republics of ancient greece and rome the franchise was confined to a small minority who governed a vast majority democracy was a reality only with reference to the small class of full fledged citizens in europe not the whole population in the medieval republic of venice the uh, franchise was confined to the strictly limited uh, aristocracy which itself was dominated by a small oligarchy in netherlands a very small body of butchers had the franchise so also france england no franchise for women even in the 19th until the beginning of the 20th century so <clears throat> the king in ancient india and the president of india the king in ancient india was like the president of the indian republic this is my view final source of executive power and legislative power and at times judicial power all executive decisions are taken in the name of the president the president can sign an ordinance and bring a law into force his signature is necessary to give effect to a law made by parliament the president can grant pardon to a person convicted and sentenced to imprisonment in, in fact he can even pardon those who are on death row the king in ancient times too enjoyed all these powers plurality of thought in ancient india <clears throat> ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti this is rigveda the truth is one but the wise perceive it differently in my view this embodies the universalism of hinduism then comes anada shloka ano bhadra kratavo yantu vishvatah meaning let noble thoughts come to us from all directions this is rigveda 1.89.1 then the third shloka i am niji paroveti ganana lagu chetasam udara charitanam tu vasudeva kutumbakam this is from the maha upanishad 6.71275 you hear prime minister narendra modi talking about vasudeva kutumbakam quite often in fact among our prime ministers and i have had the opportunity and privilege of uh, uh, getting to know many of them and uh, listening to many of them starting with indira gandhi in uh, 1971 but i must say that uh, modi ji is probably the first prime minister who is uh, so focused on the central idea that emanates from bharat vasudeva kutumbakam and what that means actually this is uh, so ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti let noble thoughts come <clears throat> come to us from all sides is indicative of tolerance the state having no religion plurality of thought in ancient india please see the connection of these shlokas and article 25 the fundamental right to profess practice and propagate religion article 28 no religious instruction in educational institutions fully funded by the state often quoted by sl- sl- scholars for projecting hinduism as a tolerant religion in fact when you look at the fundamental rights chapter in our constitution whether it is article 14 article 15 19 all the provisions in article 19 uh, 21 25 26 uh, to profess practice propagate religion and to run religious institutions 29 30 that is to have your own um script culture and so on and to have institutions to manage them article 28 no religious institution uh, no religious instruction in education institutions fully funded by the state um i as i said i have studied dozens of constitutions across the world and i am of the view that there is no constitution in the world which has this basket of rights for the minorities there is no other constitution in the world it is so comprehensive that is simply unbelievable that the and where does this come from in my view it comes from the fact that we are um, citizens 
of Bharat and Bharat has had all these traditions going back to 3000 years or more. So our constitution actually is the saransha of the great thoughts that were there uh, millennia ago. Now, according to scholars, the mantra shows the willingness of Vedic people and culture to receive noble and worthy ideas, thoughts, works from all quarters, from all parts of the universe. Ano Badra Kratavo Yantu Vishwatha. Let noble thoughts come to us from all directions. This verse emphasizes the complementarity of human knowledge. It highlights the need to learn from all the directions because knowledge is not the monopoly of any single individual or nation or race. The pursuit and expansion of knowledge is the, in the widest sense of the word is a collective human endeavor. That is why Hindu kingdoms did not impose jazia or a tax on those practicing other religions. Enough evidence in ancient India uh, it shows that the, there is enough evidence in ancient India to show that it believed in a pluralistic society. So then, um, this it emphasizes liberty, equality, fraternity. I am Niji Paroveti, Ganana Laguchetasa. Liberty, equality, fraternity. If you see that in our constitution today, you will realize that its source is here. The three fundamentals of our democracy which are embedded in the preamble of our constitution. Without these three, how can you envisage uh, the entire world as a family? Okay, I'll go back a little because I will thank you after two, three, four, five minutes more. Okay, summing up. The British through their system of education and governance sought to disconnect modern India from her past. The educational curriculum was designed in such a way that many historians and commentators were of the view that Indians were a savage race, devoid of history, culture and dignity and had to be civilized, quote-unquote. As Macaulay said in his infamous minute in 1824, Indians had to be taught the English language and the British mores and manners. Macaulay Putras, that is, Indians who studied in Macaulay's convents, fell into this trap and began deriding everything that personified Bharat. The Hindu religion, the Hindu pension, the worship of Ganga as the mother and giver of life, the worship of flora and fauna, and the attribution of divinity to various facets of the environment. The British mocked at us for worshipping what they called the monkey god or the elephant god, snakes and peacocks, and the brown sahibs, anxious to curry favor with the colonizers, began doing the same. All this was pagan culture and you would be regarded as an evolved being if you mocked at your own reality, your Hinduness, your culture and your language, ridiculing Hindu gods and goddesses, Hindu practices and rites and rituals. We all know what happened in the 1940s. The Muslims of United India demanded and secured an independent Islamic state. After partition, the Hindus of India who constituted 88% of the population chose to have a secular, liberal, democratic nation. This must be acknowledged by all Indians and global citizens. This is critical to social harmony in the country. India is a secular, democratic nation because we are civilizationally secular and democratic. This must, this too must be acknowledged wholeheartedly. I think this is very critical in our journey of 75 years and I am more or less of that age. So I have seen the rise of India from soon after independence, that is from the time our uh, constitution came into being. In fact, I am a constitutional child in that sense because I was born in 1950, soon after we adopted the constitution. And from then on, of course, I opened my eyes to the world 10 or 15 years later. And I must tell you that I have seen India's journey, our economic, social and other situation in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And uh, the way we have progressed and how far we have come. 
and all this has been possible because we are a secular democratic liberal nation and why are we a secular liberal democratic nation my argue that that is because of our civilizational strength and that core which is there in our civilization and i am also of the view that all indians and i repeat this all indians must acknowledge this fact that india is a secular democratic nation because we are civilizationally secular and democratic so so long as you keep challenging this so long as you keep saying that this has come from somewhere else we are, you are not going to have social harmony in this country it is very important you must acknowledge this this is the truth i am sorry to say that there that, that there isn't sufficient acknowledgement of this until now because of the disdain that the nehruvians have had for our civilization this is a, this has been the source of social tension according to me in this country i am also of the view that given our civilizational strength india will remain a secular liberal democratic nation only so long as it remains an overwhelmingly hindu majority nation i have no confusion about this having uh, studied this whole problem uh, over many decades swami vivekananda had prophesied that one day india would rise and shake off the colonial yoke not just in political terms but also psychologically as well i think that day has come india has now entered an era of self recognition and self respect the mekalayas at least for the moment have returned to their barracks and will hopefully remain there and the self confident atmanirbhar bharatiyas have finally taken charge so much so that i am able to dredge up dredge up this truth today in the pressings of an institution that had provided for many decades a platform primarily to nehruvians and every individual who derided what our civilization stood for it's a measure of the times we living we are living in that i have been heard with patience in this hallowed pressings today something that would not have happened if i had delivered this lecture 20 years ago so thank you very much and namaskar as i said this has been a magnificent lecture by our <clears throat> vice chairman dr a sudha prakash and he has talked about uh, democracy not simply in terms of a structure in terms of a framework but also as a metaphor as a metaphor because ultimately the question that we need to ask is this as dr surya prakash said there were specific practices in parts of ancient india for example in the buddhist sangha and in the gana sanghas which are similar to the modern practices of parliamentary democracy but leaving that thing aside what is more important as he has pointed out is the spirit of democracy and what is the spirit of democracy the spirit of democracy is of course tolerance accommodation maintaining peaceful relations permitting diversity of social religious cultural and political practices so in that sense the indian civilization has been i would say uniquely blessed because this is a country which has always drawn the attention and praise of people from all over the world from megasthenes to uh, the european travelers in the 17th and 18th centuries about these aspects which constitute the spirit of democracy this is important because we must understand that in the post second world war period a lot of countries that gained independence around that time around the time india gained its independence did adopt the forms and procedure of democracy they had they, they built some parliament they you know created some assembly or something of that sort and apparently they had a constitution apparently they had elections voting etc but within a decade or so a large number of them collapsed in terms of their democratic future they have 
you know, sometimes swung from authoritarianism to democracy, then back to some what they call democracy, but which we will not recognize as democracy. So essentially, when we compare the case of India with the case of most of those countries, and I must say here, one reason India's case is especially is that India was left in a very bad shape by the British in 1947. We were among the poorest countries of the world with one of the lowest per capita incomes. Literacy rate was just about 18%. Female literacy rate was just 6%. There was gross underdevelopment. There were famines. 70% people were below the poverty line. And yet, despite those challenges, if the leaders of this country and the people were able to enshrine a democratic system first in the constitution, as Dr. A. Suru Prakash said, and then as a society, you know, we were able to practice it for 75 years, maybe with some hiccups, no system is perfect. I think the credit, much of the credit goes to the inherent civilizational tradition of permitting diversity, permitting tolerance and maintaining peaceful coexistence in all kinds of ways. One last thing I would like to make is this. One point, last point that I would like to make is this. You know, there has been too much emphasis on the conceptual categories and frameworks which we have derived from the West. As Dr. Suri Prakash said, that Macaulayan tradition of sort of indoctrinating the Indian mind has unfortunately continued in many cases even after independence when we should have done course correction. And because of that, we often think in terms of binaries. So binaries in the sense of we think that either it is freedom or it is slavery, either it is democracy or it is dictatorship. So the West has invented these modern uh, terminologies and they have their specific organic growth of these institutions. India had a different history and all conceptual categories are ultimately a product of a specific history of each country or each society. You cannot replicate and simply transplant the conceptual categories which have organically grown from one society and you know, place them into another. Why is it that there was a French revolution in France? I was once asked this question by a French uh, you know, student. When I was a student, I said, well, because you didn't have freedom, so you needed a, a revolution to give you freedom, whereas India was always a country in which everybody could live the way they wanted to live. In Europe, you were not allowed to live the way you wanted to live. You were not allowed to practice your religion. You were not allowed to uh, go to a church of your choice. There were so many things which you were not permitted. And therefore, every society evolves a system which suits its genius, which suits its background. We talk so much about Magna Carta, for example, and we say that parliament goes back to Magna Carta in 1215. But why was Magna Carta needed? Magna Carta was needed because feudalism was dominant there and the king didn't want to give rise to the feudal lords actually. It is the feudal lords who got power from Magna Carta and yet erroneously we cite Magna Carta as the beginning of democracy. So this is one of the biggest problems. We sort of become teleological in our thinking and we start transplanting our modern things into uh, you know, the European history of 500 or 600 years ago. Whereas it is the spirit, as Dr. Suri Prakash has pointed out, which is more important. And that spirit, as he summed up from the Rig Veda, ekam asat vipraha bahudha vadanti, a civilization that is guided by something as broad as this, that truth is one, but the wise express it differently. I think that also lies behind the Gandhian idea of respect for all, respect for all religions, respect for all cultures. In that sense, the Indian civilization, Indian culture has been unique and that has been our biggest strength. So I uh, take this opportunity to once again thank uh, our Vice Chairman, Dr. A. Surya Prakash for delivering this brilliant lecture. I, I also thank I also, I also, I also thank uh, uh, you know our director Sri Sanjeev Nandan Sahai ji, and of course uh, our honourable chairman uh, Sri Nipendra Mishra ji for their august presence. Oh, thank you. And I thank all members of the audience for their very patient presence this afternoon. And I invite everyone for a cup of tea just outside.